so sorry i am like now 15 minutes late i had to hang out washing um which you know is a priority in my life um and then i realized i had lost my children um they were actually at the neighbor's house which was fine but i couldn't find them and i need to you know while i talk to you about books um i need to put my children on a device so they don't come and talk to me while i'm trying to talk to you because clearly you're the priority at this point um anyway so no i'm super sorry i'm like 15 minutes late anyway um i'm actually standing up today because i've been sitting down for a lot of today i've had heaps and heaps of schoolwork to do today so um i know uh, those of you who are teachers will appreciate how much work gets done um <clears throat> Yeah, outside of hours and on days off and so forth. I literally have not moved um, all day. I've just been doing schoolwork all day. Um, I'm also standing up because I wanted to show you something that's in the background. Um, one of my daughter's friends, Miss A, has got a zip line in her backyard and um, she, my daughter loves going over to Miss A's house and um, going on this zip line. Uh, we do not have a zip line um, in our backyard. I, look, I don't know why. Um, we've only had, you know, um, Puds just had three broken arms. I just really don't need any more in my life. Um, although our neighbours are paramedics, so, you know, we, we could have one. Anyway, we don't have one. Anyway, because we don't have one, she's actually... Created. You can't really see it probably, but can you see there that hanging on the door, there's actually a rope going from all the way across that door. It's a zip line for her babies. Um, so she's created a zip line for her dolls because we don't have a zip line for her to go on. Anyway, all right. Um, first of all, before I talk about the five books that I'm going to talk about today, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who messaged me and pinged me on social media about um, the article on me that was in the Q weekend last weekend. Um, there's the girls, woo, that way. Um, it was a really great article and uh, Frances Whiting won't be watching, but Frances Whiting was the... Um, a writer and she the journalist and I have always loved her writing and she did an outstanding job of this article I was really nervous about this article um, and I did not know I was going to be on the front cover until the day before and then I didn't sleep um, but I absolutely loved the article I was really nervous about it because um, you know I was really open with her I talked a lot about um, Dan's death and the other deaths in my family my brother and my aunt which have all been pretty recent um, so yeah, I was nervous about it, but Frances Whiting is an accomplished journalist and she did an excellent job. So I was super, super pleased. And more than anything, I was just pleased to see, um, reading on the front cover of a glossy magazine. I think that's, um, amazing. So thank you, Frances and the Courier Mail. Anyway, a quiet girl. Oh my gosh. I feel like I should um, speak really quietly while I'm talking about this book. I This is the new book by Peter Carnivus. No, I can't speak quietly. <laughs> I lasted what? I lasted four words. Uh, this is the latest book by Peter Carnivus, um, who is a Sunshine Coast-based author-illustrator. His last book was The Elephant um, and, you know, got rave reviews and was awarded so many awards. I think this one is um, going to go the same way. A Quiet Girl is about a little girl called Mary who lives in a, in a loud family. It's got really beautiful end papers. There's peaceful doves on the end papers, so I think that's really special. Um, Pete's done a gorgeous... Oh, my gosh. This, like, is so weird the way I have to move things. He's done a gorgeous inscription for my girls there with a peaceful dove. Oh, yeah, Kate, it's really beautiful. Have you read it yet, Kate? It's gorgeous. So Mary is really quiet. She lives... Um, you know, a lot in her own head. I guess she's what you'd call an introvert. Um, she thinks quiet thoughts and she says things quietly, but she lives in a really, really busy family and quite a loud family. Oh, I'm pleased you've read it, Kate. It's just gorgeous. Um, you know, everybody's really busy and they're also really loud. And throughout the book, there's lots of sound effects um, of how loud her family actually is. There's the lawnmower, there's mum on her phone, there's all sorts of things. Mary spends a lot of time watching life and appreciating the little things in life. Her family, it would be fair to say, do not. One day Mary goes missing. Um, actually, she's not really missing. She's just quiet. They can't hear her. This is my favourite page. She became so quiet that she felt like she just wasn't there. Look at that illustration. 
the colour drains out of Mary um, and she becomes invisible. It's just beautiful. Anyway, what I really, really love about this book is that Mary doesn't save the day with being quiet. This isn't a story of a quiet superhero. This is just a really gentle, peaceful story of um, making a statement, I guess, or a plea to those of us who are loud, me included, um, to listen to the quiet people, to take time to appreciate them, to learn to be quiet ourselves. And um, yeah, there's no saving of the day needed. It's just this beautiful tale of all of us taking the time to appreciate life a little bit more and appreciate the quiet people in our life. I really, really love it. I think it's got a lot of applications for school use um, in terms of, I think it's a good one for looking at things like mindfulness in schools um, and also um, appreciating the little things in life. I think it's got some good principles of sustainability in it, nature. It fits really well into the personal and social capability strand of the Australian curriculum in that it talks about um, emotions and self-regulation and that sort of thing. It's an all-round beautiful book. So I think it's a great one for school curriculums, but I also think it's a really important one for the quiet um, girls and boys in your life and for those of us like me that aren't quiet. I think it, this book spoke very deeply to me about the need to sometimes be a little bit quieter. Um, I had the absolute pleasure, and it's quite funny, Pete um, asked me if I would launch the book. And I, um, look, I said yes, um, but then quickly followed up with an email that said, you do, like, I'm really loud. But in the end, it was lovely. I think we balanced each other really nicely. He is super, super quiet himself. Um, in fact, I would say, and, and he agreed at the launch, that there's very much a lot of him in that story, as there is with all the illustrators. They always put their own, um, th themselves into the story. And he um, is probably very much like Mary. But we were a good balance, I think, at the book launch. Pete did a beautiful song um, on his, what are those little things called? What are those little guitars called? Is that a ukulele? I can't think what that is. Um, but it was a beautiful book launch. And um, I'm really looking forward later in the year to running some workshops with Peter Carnivus um, on mindfulness and mindful reading um, and the power of books in calming down our brains. We're going to be at Voices on the Coast. We're going to be at um, Story Arts Festival Ipswich. And we're going to be at Brisbane City Council Libraries later in the year. Okay, the next book I want to talk about is Juno Jones. Now, this is an advanced copy, so it's got a sticker on it and it's an uncorrected proof. And... Um, um, my seven-year-old took enormous delight in finding uh, some of the bits of it that needed to be fixed up. She loves an uncorrected proof. It's like her favourite thing in the world, an uncorrected proof. Maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe she's a future editor. I am certainly not. I, yeah, I do not see the mistakes. Um, anyway, Juno Jones' Word Ninja is absolutely perfect for beginning readers. It's written by Kate Gordon, but actually the story is really written by Juno Jones. And on the title page it actually has oh, low battery my phone has low battery it has uh, Kate Gordon's name and Sandy Fleet's name crossed out and Juno Jane Jones has put her own name in there so this is a little uh, story about Juno Jones who really really loves her school it's Mutton Mutton Bird Mutton Bay Mutton Bird Bay School and she lives in an area where there's quite a lot of schools and one of the schools is going to have to close down. So there's men in suits, government officials, coming to see which school is going to have to close down and the others will have to amalgamate. Um, Juno Jones desperately doesn't want her school to close down. She adores her school. And one of the things that the men in suits are going to be looking at is literacy levels. So the teachers decide to start a reading journal and Juno really doesn't like reading. She actually is more of a ninja um, and is really, really doesn't like reading. And she ends up turning her reading journal into um, she writes the story herself so this is a story within a story it's really quirky the jokes are very sophisticated and I absolutely loved them um, it's oh, honestly I can't tell you how much chickpea loved this she read it well, I wouldn't let her read it all in one sitting because I wanted her to slow down a little bit with her reading. She absolutely adored it. You can see from the text type um, sort of the level of that it's at. There's lots of great illustrations. It's super funny. And the best news of all is that it's the start of a series. It's not out for a couple of days yet, but you can pre-order it on Booktopia. And I've put the link, um, I was going to say in the show notes. I don't have show notes. I've put the link in the Facebook um, thing. Um, it's just fantastic. This is a great one for newly independent readers. 
I super duper enjoyed it. It's really fast paced. It would be good for reluctant readers, um, but it's also, it's just a fabulously fun story. It's yeah, really quirky. I, I liked it a lot. All right, one tree. Oh, this one arrived in the mail um, on an afternoon where I was going out to dinner with um, two of my favorite teachers, Lyndall O'Gorman and Kate Daly. Um, Kate Daly might be related to me. Um, and I, they, they love picture books. They're picture book lovers. So I actually took this book out to dinner with us. Um, Linda Logorman is also an academic and she loves Bruce Watley and she has looked um, at some of the stuff that he's done with his PhD, which was into drawing with his left hand because drawing um, Bruce Watley is the illustrator of things like Diary of a Wombat. Um, he did a PhD a few years ago into um, the effect that it would have if he drew with his left hand and then some of his more recent books like Flood um, and the Anzac Day one, name escapes me, are done with his left hand and it's a completely different style of illustration and oh my gosh, it's stunning. So I took this book out to dinner because I just, I hadn't read it, but I just knew it would be astonishing. Um, Christopher Chang is one of my favorite um, authors and Bruce Watley, I mean, clearly Bruce Watley is everyone's favorite illustrator in Australia, seriously. Um, oh, look at that, no end paper. I wonder why not. There would have to be a reason for that because Bruce Watley's really into design. Anyway, I will give them that one. I won't complain. Um, it's called One Tree. It's about a um, family who have... Um, so it starts with Grandad and he grew up in a um, mountain village and it goes through Grandad's life in this mountain village or grandfather's life in this mountain village and how wonderful his childhood was and how much he enjoyed it. Then we um, come to present day where grandfather is now living in a high rise apartment with um, his family and as many Chinese families do, so good at looking after their elders um, and generations living together. He, grandfather's really, really sad. He is not really loving living in the city. Nobody talks to him in the markets and there is no plants in the city. One day his grandson finds a tree that, it, well, not a tree yet, a seedling which is going to, he knows, um, die in between the cobblestones and he picks it out and takes it home to his grandfather who shows very little interest at all uh, until um, he, he just can't, um, you know, all those roots come back to him of being a great gardener and he wants and he starts looking after this tree oh gosh this book the story sent shivers down my spine um it was it's the most beautiful story it's the sort of book you can take out to dinner with your friends and share it with them it's just stunning um it's you know it looks at the importance of elders in our lives and their stories of their lives um, it looks at the importance of community, of nature in our lives, and nature in a big city is stunning. I just, Christopher Chang, if you are watching, oh, this is magnificent. This is as good as that book he wrote like a long time ago called One Child, which is still one of my all-time favorite children's books. I'm saying it early, you heard it here first. This will be on the picture book list for the um, short list for the Children's Book Council of Australia Awards next year. It's stunning. It, I think it will just scoop the pool. Now, what I find really interesting, the other reason I took this to dinner is that Linda O'Gorman and Kate are um, really big fans of the work of Narelle Oliver, who was a really dear friend of mine and she passed away a few years ago and she was um, renowned for her lino cut illustrations in her award-winning books so i opened this book and i was like wow bruce watley's doing lino cutting narelle would love this and i would have loved to discuss it with narelle so instead i discussed it with these ladies googled it when i got to the restaurant all digital so at first i was scandalized and then i read a little bit more about how he learned to do this digitally and my mind is blown these illustrations are just stunning. And there's a really beautiful article on the Penguin um, website with him explaining uh, the technique and why he chose this technique. It's a beautiful article. What I love about Bruce Watley is that he always pushes himself. I mean, the man could stay with the tried and true illustrations that he's done forever, like in Diary of a Wombat, and yet he doesn't. He then went on to learn to draw with his left hand. He um, is now doing this digital lino cutting technique. Um, 
he's just always pushing the boundaries and himself with his art and what a treasure to have um you know the children of australia and the world are so lucky to have uh someone like bruce watley who you know could be selling his artwork for millions in art galleries um and he puts it in picture books for a, a wide audience i just i adore the man he's astonishing anyway i'm talking way too long this is like meant to be 15 minutes but it's, you know, this is my show, so I can do what I want. All right, next one. His name is Walter. Um, I tried to get uh, Pusta, my 11-year-old, to read this for ages. And she kept saying, I don't want to read it. Even though she had loved um, The Shop at Hooper's Bend, also by Emily Rodder. She just, I don't know, she just was like, meh, don't want to read it. Didn't appeal to her. The blurb didn't appeal. Finally, a friend of hers said to her, this is such a great book. And she read it and adored it. Look at those end papers. Hello, it feels beautiful. It looks beautiful. It's stunning. Totally giftable. All right. This is a story within a story. Um, some children, so we're in modern day at the moment, and some children are on a school excursion with their teacher. The bus breaks down and the, there's this awful, awful storm and they take shelter in a nearby house um, where they end up having to stay overnight and ends up being some of the class go on with another teacher to the town to get help. Um, so four, four students and their teacher are in this house. Exploring this house, looking for things like candles, um, they are drawn to this old chest where they find an amazing handwritten book with astonishing illustrations in it. And um, they decide to read this book aloud. Well, this book is, um, as I said, handwritten. It was obviously sitting there waiting to be found. Um, and it is this tale, historical tale of a family uh, who lost their fortune. And uh, it's a story of lost love and it's beautiful. Um, the story gets a bit creepier and creepier. The students are quite scared in this house. The teacher decides, the book is part of what is scaring them and she asks them to stop reading it, uh, which is what I would have done. Um, and they don't. Um, it's just amazing. Now, it does mix fantasy, historical fiction, magical realism, mystery, some supernatural elements. It like blends it all up in a blender and it's all in this book. In a less accomplished, by a less accomplished writer, I don't think this book would have worked. Um, you know, even when I say that now, I think, oh, that's an awful lot of genres to smash into the one book. But Emily Rodder is, I mean, she's a masterful storyteller, isn't she? And yeah, I don't think anybody else could have written this book except Emily Rodder. Um, and it's stunning. Now, if your children have already read this one, I would highly recommend The Shop at Hooper's Bend, which has similar-ish themes of magical realism um, and it is equally as magical um, storytelling. I, oh gosh, I just really, really love this book. It's wonderful. And then we move on to my final book, which is also, oh my gosh, uh, the slightly, I've got to read this title, The Slightly Alarming Tale of the Whispering Wars, a Kingdoms and Empires book by Jacqueline Moriarty, illustrations by Kelly Canby. Um, I have to read it because I just I forget the title every time. It's so long. Come on, Jacqueline Moriarty. Ooh, piece of origami just fell out of this book. Um, so, Pudster has now read this book twice, and we are doing this book at the moment for our Year 6 um, book club, which is meeting next Wednesday night. And I've had really good feedback so far from all of the students who've read it. It's quite a big book. Um, however, there are some illustrations. Not a huge amount, but there are some. So I'm just going to read you the first line of this book, and then I'm going to show you something else. So Jacqueline Moriarty, for those of you who were wondering, is indeed the sister of Leanne Moriarty. Um, Helena, my 10-year-old daughter was exactly the same as Pudster and just couldn't pick it up. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, she just wouldn't pick it up. Anyway, she ended up loving it. Um, it's got some, as with all good fantasy books, it starts with a map of the world and of the world of the book, which I love. And then it's got some opening words, which I'm going to read to you. I was taken by the whisperers at 2 p.m. So I never pulled the lever for the laundry chute. That's what bothered me the most. This is way ahead in the story, though. A lot happened before then. I'm only saying it up front because it bothered me so much, the missing out. 
And then it starts chapter one. And it says, Finlay here, I'm starting the story, but a girl named Honeybee takes over in the next chapter. You'll miss me then. And you'll say, I wish that Finlay was back. I liked him. You won't like Honeybee. Trust me on that. All right, so that's the start of this book. I, at the same time that she was reading that one, was reading the Jacqueline Moriarty adult book, Gravity is the Thing, which uh, like I sobbed in the end pages of. Um, but I just want to read you the opening line of this. A tall man at the airstrip took my suitcase. Snow, he said, smiling, as he took my suitcase from me. I stared. I'll step right into my story at this point. Abigail Sorensen, but you can call me Abby, 35 years old. I just felt like those beginnings were so similar. I absolutely loved both of the beginnings. I think it's an extraordinary way to start the book with the characters introducing themselves and sort of welcoming the reader into the book. I just loved that. So I don't know, I'm, I'm sure she didn't do that deliberately, but I thought it was beautiful that they both kind of matched. Anyway, um, I'm just gonna read a little bit of the blurb of this one because it's a quite complicated story to describe. The town of Spindrift is frequented by pirates and charlatans. It's also home to the orphanage school where Finlay, Finlay lives with Glim, Tanya and Ellie. Eli, just outside town is the painfully posh Brathelwaite boarding school, home to Honeybee, Hamish, Victor, Duke of Ainsley. When the two schools compete at the Spindrift tournament, stakes are high, but tensions are higher. And before long, the orphans and the boarding school are in an all out war. So that's the premise. But then there's another bit of a story happening where children are disappearing. And in the end, the orphaned children and the children from Brathelwaite have to work really hard together. Wow, this is an astonishing, astonishing tale. As I said, it's got some pencil illustrations to break up the text, but it's just magical. It, um, it pulls you in with its cast of amazing characters and you really don't want to leave the world that Jacqueline Moriarty has created. It is just spectacular. I, I just can't recommend it highly enough for readers from about I don't know, nine, very good nine-year-old reader, probably 10, I would recommend more, 10 to 13. Um, I just have so enjoyed it. Now, if you've if your children have read this one, there is the Bronte Metal Stone. Oh my gosh, Jacqueline Moriarty, why did you do such long titles? The other title and their companion novels is The Extremely Inconvenient Adventures of Bronte Metal Stone. So they don't, Bronte Metal Stone was first, but you don't really have to read them in order. In fact, I didn't read them in order and they are companion books. They're just both set in the same um, world. They're just spectacular. Honestly, I can't recommend them highly enough. That is my five books. I am so sorry. I have spoken for like half an hour and I did start late due to small children. Uh, I do apologize for those small children making me late, but um, yeah, I have nothing else to say, but I quite like talking to people on the internet. Yeah, anyway, I should probably go and hang out the next load of washing. I have done five loads of washing. Okay. That's me done. Have a great weekend. Tell me what you're reading this weekend.